I believe a wise man once said, Look, Look let's, let's get, get right, right to, to it. it. John Mayer was one of the most important artists for millennials and especially millennial guitarists into blues, rock, funk, pop, or jam band style music. Now, if you're a millennial guitarist, none of this will be news to you. You probably wanted to go to Berklee College of Music after learning that he and the Dream Theater Boys attended, and you've probably been trying to get your older friends to understand that John Mayer is more than Daughters and Your Body is a Wonderland, but more on that later. In this video, I'm going to explain what made him iconic using song examples from the first 10 years of his career. And yes, John went on to make many more albums, but his first decade accumulating in the DVD Where the Light Is, that solidified him as an all-time great, so let's begin in 1999 with his first EP, Inside Once Out. When this EP was released, Mayer was basically unknown and very few current fans heard this music in 1999 when it came out. Nonetheless, every fan has a story of going back after the fact to rediscover some of the gems on this record. Now, most of these songs were re-recorded for his debut album, Room for Squares, a couple of years later. But three of the best songs, Victoria, Quiet, and Comfortable, did not make their way onto the Room for Squares album. And that's a shame because I believe Comfortable is one of John's best songs of all time. Let me know which of these early songs you like the most in the comments below. So for all the guitarists watching, this song is supposed to be played with a capo, but I don't own a capo, so I have to do my best without it. Anyway, I remember about 10 or 15 years back, I saw a clip of John Mayer explaining his idea for the song Comfortable, and his basic idea was to take a chord progression that was super sophisticated and almost classical sounding, and then to mix that with lyrics that were very simple and down to earth. And those two ideas created the song Comfortable. And I think he did a really good job of achieving that goal. I mean, how often do you hear a pop song with chords like this? In 2001, John released Room for Squares, which is by far his most pop album. In addition to having several songs from the original EP, Room for Squares also had Your Body is a Wonderland, which won him a Grammy for Best Male Pop Vocal. Now, I personally believe that Your Body is a Wonderland, I mean, I think it's a great song, but I think it's honestly one of the weakest songs on the album. And when you have a hit of that level, it's easy to get stuck in that pop music realm. That's exactly what happened to Vanessa Carlton after the success of A Thousand Miles and its subsequent feature in the comedic film, White Chicks. If you go back and listen to her album, you'll probably agree that she has so much more to offer and many great songs that people just didn't hear or take seriously, but that's a rant for a different video. Nonetheless, all the guitarists knew John Mayer was the real deal when we attempted to play the main lick from Neon. And if Neon is the most iconic guitar part from that album, I would say that St. Patrick's Day is the best combination of John's distinctive, clever lyrical writing mixed with great harmonies. And St. Patrick's Day is very similar to Comfortable in that they both have very sophisticated chord progressions, but also very down-to-earth lyrics. I mean, the chords in this song, St. Patrick's Day, are more common in, like, fairly sophisticated jazz songs. I mean, how often do you hear something like that in a pop song? Now, this video is mainly intended for non-musicians, but this part of John Mayer's writing is really more common in his early years, and I really love this and kind of miss it in his later albums, so I don't know. If you're a guitarist or a musician and you want a lesson where I break down John Mayer's most sophisticated and intricate chord progressions, let me know in the comments below. The song tells the story of a romantic relationship that's being held together simply by the need for a companion for the holiday season from roughly November to St. Patrick's Day in March. I venture to say that every heterosexual male in his early 20s has kept the relationship going in the winter, only to end it right as spring break rolls around and fun outside events start to pick up. Or maybe I'm just revealing how much of a jerk I was when I was in my 20s. Anyway, 2003's Heavier Things is a very interesting album because, in my opinion, it's his weakest album as a whole, but you can really see his guitar influences peeking through the songs. Clarity has a strong funk influence and a ton of groovy riffs. 
and in my opinion, the lyrics hold up pretty well. And Come Back to Bed is perhaps the first song where he really starts to show his heavy blues influences. That's especially true in his live versions with extended guitar solos. And honestly, the verses for Come Back to Bed have great songwriting, but the chorus and the title are just too cheesy for the Stevie Ray Vaughan guitarist generation to take seriously. And of course, Daughters won him another Grammy, this time for Song of the Year. But for me, this is a pivotal moment in John's career, but for a different reason. See, guitarists who took the time to watch his live performances and listen to interviews, we all knew that he had sick guitar skills. But, well, do you remember when I mentioned Vanessa Carlton and how she got stuck as the Thousand Miles Girl? Well, when your two most iconic songs are Daughters and Your Body is a Wonderland, you're dangerously close to becoming known as just another pop heartthrob. It's still not the right choice of a single, but this is nice to have. But John's next move was frankly genius. In 2005, John formed the John Mayer Trio and released the album Try with Steve Jordan and Pino Palladino. Playing in a trio as a singer-guitarist is pretty difficult, which definitely shows a level of artistry. But for those of you who don't understand this type of cosmic shift of going from a big pop band to a trio, think about Miley Cyrus and how she transitioned from being Disney World's Hannah Montana to being the person who did Can't Be Tamed and Bangers. That's basically what the John Mayer trio was doing for John Mayer's career. The hit song from the Try album, Who Did You Think I Was? Well, that debuted John Mayer in Long Hair and a music video that only has three musicians, one of which being John Mayer, of course, performing in his studio. No more walking on boardwalks or singing to a girl in a bed, none of that. We're just playing an iconic Jimi Hendrix guitar with an aggressive guitar lick front of the mix. Now, if you aren't a musician, you probably don't know that these men who he's featured with, Pino Palladino and Steve Jordan, these are some of the highest regarded musicians among other musicians. They reached legendary status in the late 1980s when John Mayer was only a teenager. So getting them to play in his trio when he was the 28 year old pretty boy who released Your Body is a Wonderland, that was just a genius career choice. Try also featured covers from artists like Jimi Hendrix and Ray Charles, which again shows his rock and blues R&B influences, and straight up blues songs like Out of My Mind. And yes, you still had more poppy songs like Good Love Is On The Way and Vultures, but these songs had a lot more grit to them in the trio format, especially with Pino and Steve backing him. And also, some of John's best writing to date was from the trio album. It's lyrics like this. Here is a line that you won't understand. I'm half of a boy, but I'm twice a man. Carry the weight of the world in the palm of my hand. Who did you think I was? Now, I'm not a poet by training, so I can't explain the literary devices being used in these lyrics, but it's the type of thing that John was going to show a lot more in his album, Continuum. By the way, if you like these type of musical deep dives, and especially if you're a guitarist, you're going to want to check out my newsletter, link below. So for most people watching this video, Continuum will be the album that we say is John Mayer's crowning jewel. And I get into a lot of fights with John Mayer fans about this, so if you agree with me, leave a comment below saying so, and if you don't, tell me what you think his best album actually is. But I still don't think any singular album has come close to the genius of Continuum. But first, let's get a couple of things out of the way. Yes, Continuum did win a Grammy for Best Pop Vocal. It also won a Grammy for Best Male Pop Vocal Performance for the song Waiting on the World to Change. And Waiting on the World to Change was also the opening song on the album. And it's a good song. I'm not saying it's a bad song. It's definitely a good song. But out of the 12 songs on the Continuum album, Waiting on the World to Change is definitely not in the top five and is probably not even in the top 10. There's so much more to the Continuum album. With the Continuum album, John Mayer achieved a few of the most difficult things any popular musician could ever achieve. Number one, it is literally a perfect album. Every single song on Continuum is at least good, meaning if you're listening on your headphones, there's never a song on the album where you have to rush to your phone to skip over. On top of that, Several of the songs are all-time greats, period. Songs that my kids will probably one day hear, even if I don't play them for them myself. And John also struck the perfect balance of pop and contemporary music. 
Songs like Gravity and Slow Dancing in a Burning Room are very clearly bluesy songs, but they don't go too far into either the blues or the pop direction. But let me give you a concrete example of what I mean with this. Okay, so I've been playing guitar for 20 years. I have a PhD in music and I teach music at universities. I'm the annoying guy who hears a classical song playing in a mall and then says, that's Mozart Symphony Number no. 41, also known as Jupiter. Or I'll hear a jazz song in a coffee shop and then I'll say, hmm, this song is from Bitches Brew. Very few beverage establishments delve into Miles Foray into the avant-garde. I'm the that annoying asshole guy that you know. By contrast, my non-musician significant other, she unironically loves Imagine Dragons and she self-reportedly hates blues and jazz, despite the fact that her boyfriend is a jazz blues guitarist. Anyway, the point being is that we both love, absolutely love Gravity and Slow Dancing in a Burning Room and the entire Continuum album. The only other music we both agree on is Earth, Wind and & Fire and of course Taylor Swift, which just goes to show how great the Continuum album really is. Here are a couple more examples. We have a very cheesy title, I Don't Trust Myself With Loving You, but the cheesiness is balanced out with an amazing intro guitar solo, So even if you want to roll your eyes at the title, after hearing the intro solo and the harmonies during the chorus, you just can't dislike the song anymore. And back to Gravity, that is probably John's best example of incredibly sparse lyrics and music that is still crazy powerful. After all, what human hasn't felt so down that it feels like a literal fundamental cosmic interaction must be at the heart of their string of bad luck or misery? I know I have. Gravity is working against me. Gravity wants to keep me down. Very, very simple lyrics, but very, very effective. Also, in terms of memorable little licks, Gravity is pretty much as simple as it can get. It's just the same three notes or four notes play slightly differently each time. That's really all gravity is, and yet it's still so memorable and still so iconic. And then we have songs like Belief that are just crazy clever. Belief is a beautiful armor, but makes for the heaviest sword. Like punching underwater, you never can hit who you're trying for. And then even the cheesy lyrics on Continuum, they just work. I'm in repair. I'm not together, but I'm getting there. There's just something about the simplicity and honesty that works really well. I've been struggling for weeks to summarize the greatness of this album because literally every single song is perfect, but one thing I cannot conclude without mentioning is of course the song Slow Dancing in a Burning Room, and this is simply one of the best pieces of music in the early 2000s from every single angle, period. The first three notes of this song are so iconic that they instantly set the mood and everyone on the planet recognizes those three opening notes. And to be honest, I don't think the lyrics as a whole are John Mayer's best writing, but the lyric, my dear, we're slow dancing in a burning room, that imagery alone is enough to make the song an all-time classic. Okay, so Continuum was amazing, and the next album, which I believe was Battle Studies, was also pretty good, but frankly, I can't imagine any album after Continuum actually comparing to what it was. In my opinion, the first leg of his career, so to speak, really ends in 2008 with the live DVD, Where the Light Is. This DVD kind of puts a nice bow on the rise of John Mayer. And in most instances, the versions of the song as performed on the DVD are the best versions of the song, period. So the DVD, Where the Light Is, has three sets. The first set is an acoustic set comprised of solo and dual performances. This is of course how John Mayer started his career, and the song he opened with, Neon, goes back to his very first 1999 EP. Set two is the John Mayer Trio, with songs mostly from the Trio album, and a ton of guitar soloing from John Mayer. And set three features a huge band of top musicians, and largely centers on the songs from Continuum. I think it's great that he also included Why Georgia from Room for Squares, instead of Your Body is a Wonderland, which is from that same album. The former is simply a much better song. 
And I personally would have liked a couple more deep tracks from earlier albums like Covered in the Rain or Comfortable Olivia or St. Patrick's Day. But at the same time, I'm happy the entire Heavier Things album was omitted apart from Daughters, which I guess he had to play for the audience. Anyway, let's wrap things up here. John Mayer successfully avoided becoming typecast as a pop guy despite having two huge pop hits early in his career. It's still not the right choice of a single, but this is nice to have. He also brought iconic guitarists like B.B. King and Buddy Guy to a younger generation of guitar player, and I know for a fact that spurred a lot of us to dig more into the classic blues catalog. And yes, there are other singer-songwriter guitarists like Gary Clark Jr. and David Ryan Harris who should have gotten more attention in the early 2000s. But John also featured them on tour and in performances along with other modern legends like Isaiah Sharkey. Anyway, this video is already too long. I'm Andre Flood. Check out all of my stuff, link below, and I'll talk to you soon. I believe a wise man once said, look, let's get right to it.